The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. I'm Harlan Johnson, and you know it's football season in Nebraska, and my guest, none other than Dr. Tom Osborne, we're talking about the national championships that we've won in the past. I'm Sam Truax, and today on Live and Learn, my guest, Dwayne Havorka of the Nebraska Wildlife Federation, will tell us about the importance and the joys of establishing a wildlife certified wildlife habitat yard. Hats off to you, women's hats are back. Join us on Live and Learn. We're going to take a look at what's happening in the hat industry right here on Live and Learn. Have you always wanted to implement that great idea that you've had for your own business? Well, Steve Boers from SCC's Entrepreneurship Center will be here today to tell you just how you can do that. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Harlan Johnson. You know, it's football season in Nebraska. And as I'm driving down Stadium Drive, look up at that stadium and I see a couple of figures that kind of jump out. You know, 1970, 1994. Hey, those are national championship years and we ought to do some recognition on that. So, uh, somebody to reminisce about those years? Who other than Dr. Tom Osborne? So, Dr. Tom is my guest today. Thank you for coming and being on Live and Learn, Tom. Well, thanks, Harlan. It's good to be here. Now, what was your position in the, the first national championship? Well, I was a, um, just an assistant coach, and uh, on that staff, uh, Bob didn't give anybody titles, but I was, uh, I guess, kind of an ex officio offensive coordinator. I was calling the plays primarily from the press box and working with the quarterbacks, and um, so that's what I was doing, and of course, recruiting and all the, all the things that assistant coaches do. Now. Did you operate out of the old box on the north end zone for a few years up there? Were you in that position? No. No? <clears throat> we okay. were up in the, in the in, press box. In the box. press box. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, there's a lot of advantages to having a, a national championship. Uh, 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 well, recruiting, of course, is one. Uh, what are some of the other advantages maybe to the school uh, for a national championship? Well, there are, obviously there are cer certain financial rewards for a national championship. Uh, uh, I think if you look at uh, memorabilia, uh, clothing items, uh, and some of those re result in royalties to the athletic department or to the school, and um, those sales go up. Also, uh, I think there's kind of a, a general idea that enrollment, interest in a school increases when you have that kind of national exposure. Uh, certainly for people in the state, but also people uh, nationally uh, begin to notice your school. So uh, I think there are quite a few uh, benefits that come from a national championship and that kind of recognition. Now you mentioned the word memorabilia. Do you have around your house some memorabilia of the first national championship? Yeah, uh, there's, I've got a lot of pictures and different things and uh, but I, I don't really dwell on them much. I don't look at old films or those kinds of things but we, we do have some things that are uh, reminiscent of those years, pictures of Bob Devaney, pictures of, the, of those teams and, uh, and certainly remember most of those players. Okay, now once you've been a national championship, uh, is it easier then to uh, set the arena to be involved in the second one? Well, I think there are pluses and minuses, Harlan. Um, once you've won a national championship, you realize that it's possible. And it's kind of like breaking the four-minute mile. Once somebody did it, then lots of people all of a sudden realize, well, this is humanly possible. Or to, to break the barrier of, of uh, 10 flat, a hundred yard dash, you know, at one time it was assumed you couldn't do that. And once somebody did it, then everybody began to do it. And um, so your players developed the mentality, well, we did it last year, why not this year? And um, 
But on the other hand, the uh, the downside is that sometimes uh, the seeds of success also sow the seeds of decline because people begin to rest on their laurels sometimes. Sometimes people uh, become more absorbed with personal goals, personal achievement rather than team success. And uh, you see it in professional teams where uh, everybody has their own radio show, writes a book, uh, makes public appearances, and uh, and they begin to lose track of the things that got them there. So it can go either way, but I, I would say generally having won one before uh, makes it a little bit more likely that you will in the future. Now, you reminded me when you talk about when, when somebody achieves that b benchmark in terms of the four minute mile, et cetera. Uh, you were kind of the guru of the psychology episode of telling the team in the, in the 20 year ago uh, that you can do this and this is how it's gonna be done. And at the second half, uh, they're gonna be tired and there's gonna be a big play. And you implanted some seeds there uh, now, uh, and, and of course, then psychologists uh, begin to be paid employees of, empl of uh, stadiums, mm -hmm. uh, uh, t encouraging uh, and telling players, you can do this, you can do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, were you, uh, your psychology background uh, set the mm -hmm. ground for that? Well, um, I certainly felt that there is a strong connection between uh, the mental side of athletics and the physical. And uh, there's no, no question that that was important. We had a guy named Jack Stark who was, um, a, uh, had a PhD in psychology and Jack worked with our team and was very, very effective, I thought. And uh, so I think what you're alluding to is that at the halftime of, uh, of the Orange Bowl game 1994, at the end of the 94 season, it was actually January of 95, we were playing Miami and uh, it wasn't that I was psychic. It wasn't that I had great uh, <laughs> ability to predict what would happen, but I could see that there was a lot of uh, talking going on out on the field, particularly from the Miami players. I could also see that Miami players appear to be getting a little bit fatigued, which was kind of surprising because that was their environment, you know, high humidity, and we were coming from probably 15% humidity into 85, 90% humidity. And, uh, but I thought we were wearing them down. And I also thought that there would be a strong likelihood that at some point, some critical point in the second half, that uh, somebody was gonna get a personal foul because of all the conversation. And I just cautioned our players that they were, when, when things got heated, the first thing they would do is to drop their hands because you know the natural tendency when somebody pokes at you and you got your hands up and you poke back and it's always the guy that punches back that gets called. And so I said, drop your hands, keep your mouth shut, and uh, I think that we'll be the beneficiary of a call that will be pretty instrumental. And in, in, in the second half, we did have one of those. And strangely enough, the guy that was involved was Christian Peter. And Christian would probably have been the person that was least likely <clears throat> on our team to drop his hands and walk away from an altercation. And um, so when he did that, and uh, we benefited from that penalty, that was a huge turning point in the game. Well, yes, uh, I, re I remember the, those incidents and uh, uh, how Warren Sapp was uh, sucking air and that sort of thing. Now, are, th are there any really negative things that come out of a national championship? Well, the, uh, the thing that happened, for instance, in 94, uh, we were a very positive story because we hadn't won a, a national championship in 20 years or something like that. And so it was kind of a feel-good season. And of course, Tommy Frazier was, was injured and was out for most all of the year. And Brooke Behringer took over. And then Tommy got healed up. And both of them played in the Orange Bowl. and. Um, so we were somewhat media favorites at that point. But once you're elevated to that point, then the next story often is, well, what's wrong with you? And uh, 
So we had a couple players that got out of line, Lawrence Phillips being one of them. And then the focus, of course, was, well, uh, this is a, a bad group of people, uh, you know. And, uh, and so I think the, um, the problem with winning a national championship and getting on the media radar makes you more vulnerable to negative consequences as well. So uh, uh, that's, that's just part of the price you pay, and you hope that you can hold up uh, to that scrutiny. Now, as an average fan, I think back those names that you mentioned, uh, household uh, names in the sports arena anyway, you know, Corey Schlesinger and Tommy and Brooke Berenger, and Zach Wiegert, uh, do you have contacts with those guys that come back and that sort of thing? You see them? Yeah, I, I probably visit with three or four or five players every week. And uh, so that's one of the great things about coaching is those, uh, you know, the, the uh, trophies tarnish and rings no longer mean a whole lot. And uh, people forget about the championships. But the relationships endure. And... Um, so uh, probably coached somewhere around 2,000 players over all of those years. And uh, so uh, a lot of those relationships remain very strong. Now, in the sports world, you're famous for the time that you went for the win rather than the tie. Uh, uh, that was one you didn't win. Any thoughts about that one? Well. It wasn't a particularly heroic decision on my part. I, I just assumed that if you were going to win a national championship, you had to win the game. I didn't think that, you know, I was a, I voted on the coaches poll and I knew that I would not vote uh, for a team to win the national championship if they had settled for a tie when they had a chance to win it. And so that was before the, the days of, of overtime periods. Now, you know, if we'd had an overtime, we could have kicked the point, and then we'd have had an overtime period to win it or lose it. And uh, so we had a two-point play. We were behind by one, and we could have kicked the point. There's about 35, 40 seconds left, and probably would have tied the game. And um, some people said, well, you would have won the national championship because you were undefeated. And, um, but we opted to go for the two points and go for the win. And uh, it's a play we normally would have executed, but we just came up short. And um, so we lost. And uh, Miami was national champions, and we weren't. Uh, now, you started to talk about this a little bit. Uh, do you ever get some of the old tapes out uh, just to reminisce? Really don't. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll see a film clip or something somewhere, and. Uh, but I don't, I don't ever sit down and watch a whole game. Now, occasionally on the Big Ten Network, I'll see a replay of an old Nebraska game, and it'll catch my attention, and I'll probably sit there and watch it. But I also look at a lot of replays of some other famous games that don't, don't involve okay. Nebraska. Okay. So, but I don't, I don't get out a CD or a tape and look at it uh, in its entirety. Okay. Now, you personally have been involved uh, with the committee to select the way that now they choose a national championship and that f uh, formula. Uh, you and Barry were on that uh, as coaches. Uh, uh, give us some thoughts about uh, your involvement there. Well, it's been interesting. Uh, we have a, a good group of people. I think they're very dedicated to try to find the best four teams. Uh, sometimes you'd think, well, uh, there would be some uh, inclination to play favorites and uh, to promote one team over another or one conference over another, and I didn't see that at all. I, I really felt that all the people on the committee were working very hard to try to find what, in their mind, was the, the best four teams, the strongest four teams. And so, um, fairly involved process, we, uh, we traveled to Dallas seven straight weeks. We'd fly down there on a Monday morning and meet Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Tuesday morning, do our um, uh, due diligence and balloting and, and then fly back home. But in the meantime, you'd watch a lot of films, watch a lot of games, 
and uh, study uh, statistics and all those kind of things. So it was a fairly sophisticated and fairly time-consuming process. And I think last year was December 6th that we had to make the final decision. And, um, and I thought that probably for the most part it worked out very well for the committee and for college football. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to expand to eight, an eight-team playoff or a 16 playoff, but I, as I see it, uh, the um, college presidents, the um, commissioners have decided it should be four, and I think it will stay at four for some time. Well, it uh, proved to be that your uh, judgment was very profound with the teams that you picked. I know across the country, a lot of people were saying, Ohio, eh, I don't know, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, you proved to be uh, the wiser ones uh, and uh, very definitely to have the, the teams that should be there. Uh, now, are you involved again in, in this uh, process? Yeah, I, I told them I would sign up for two years, and so this will be my second and my last year. Okay. Well, Tom, a lot of good history here, and you brought a lot of very favorable moments uh, to sports fans across Nebraska. And, uh, of course, bringing a national championship uh, or uh, just uh, some of the rewards. Thank you for coming and being on the Live and Learn Show and uh, talking about uh, your experiences of the national championship, which uh, we begin to think about this time of year. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. I'm Sam Truex, and today on Live and Learn, my guest is Dwayne Havorka, Executive Director of the Nebraska Wildlife Federation. Mr. Havorka is going to tell us about certified habitat yards. Dwayne, what is a certified habitat yard or area? Well, Sam, the National Wildlife Federation created the Backyard Habitat Program back in the 1970s to help people make a place for wildlife in their backyards. It's since been expanded to schoolyards, churchyards, workplaces. Um, but the bottom line is to try to provi provide a place for wildlife um, right where you live and providing five key elements. So it's food, water, shelter, nesting space, and then sustainable management. And the food can come from the things you plant. So berries, nuts, um, grasses, uh, nectar, flowers, seeds, all kinds of things that can provide food for wildlife. The water can come as easy as just a bird bath or a dish of water on the ground. Some people like to get fancy ponds, water features, uh, maybe their own rain garden, but water is usually a pretty easy one. Uh, shelter is important if you think about those windy Nebraska days or those cold Nebraska winters. Um, trying to provide some shrubs um, that will provide protection. Evergreens are a good choice. Uh, because they'll provide protection well into the winter. And of course, you can always build or buy your own bat boxes or bird houses, so shelter is important. Um, a place to raise your young is, is important, and it really varies by the species. So um, you think about butterflies. Some butterflies have specific host plants that they have to lay their eggs on. Um, amphibians, like frogs and toads, need some water at some point in order to lay their eggs so they can hatch. Um, so nesting space is really pretty important. You got birds that use different kinds of trees or there's ground nesting birds. Um, so that's really you have to think about the species that you want to attract when you're thinking about nesting space. And finally sustainable management. If you're going to try to encourage pollinators like bees and butterflies, um, on one hand with the things you plant, you don't want to be using poisons like pesticides um, and killing them on the other hand. So we really encourage people to use organic gardening methods. Um, to use sustainable water methods, to use a lot of native plants because they're already well adapted to the area and the wildlife already adapted to them. Well, wouldn't we have to have a large amount of area in order for us to really be certified in this? Would the homeowner have to have a larger area than? You, you, do, you don't really. Um, there are some large acreages that are part of the program, even some farms in Nebraska. 
Um, there are also schoolyards and, and larger areas, but really it, the program was originally built for backyards and even somebody with an apartment with a patio, you put a little water out there, you plant the right things in some planters, you've got the five elements right there, food, water, shelter, nesting and management, and you can have a certified backyard wildlife right there on your apartment patio. On your patio, wow. That's not a very large area, but the need for habitat is really getting a lot of publicity and a lot of emphasis these days particularly the federal government and the, is trying to have wildlife plantings along the roadways and along federal lands even. And in Nebraska, 54,000 acres of, of habitat was lost in 2012. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of it emphasizes the fact that urban gardens like this, even the small areas, are important to maintain a habitat. So. Are people planning that, you think, in response to the need for wildlife habitat, or they just want butterflies or something? I think both. both. <laughs> I think people love to hear birds in the morning chirping. They love to see birds and butterflies um, at the feeder and in the yard. But I think increasingly people are recognizing that our bee populations are declining, our monarch butterfly populations are declining, bats and toads and frogs are all in trouble as well. And so what excites me is to see people who are gardening for wildlife because they wa love wildlife also saying, what can I do to make a difference? And in the case of something like a monarch, if you've already got a lot of flowers in your yard, just adding um, some milkweeds that yes. um, monarchs will use to lay their eggs on, um, adding some dill or some fennel for the black, -tailed, for the, uh, black swallowtail yeah. butterflies, um, that's helpful. Uh, and in fact, it, butterflies actually drink not from open water, but from mud flats. So if you create your own little mud flat in your yard. So there's some, some things that people can do to make a difference. And I think that's exciting. It's great to do this for yourself. It's also so, fun so to make a So if uh, people actually start, started learning about that, they would learn the fact that if they want butterflies, they should have a little mud flat, for example. That's somewhere, is that on the website, you suppose? It is, it and is there's a the lot of information on the web. There's a lot there. Um, we've got some at NebraskaWildlife.org and the National Wildlife Federation website, NWF.org. So to get habitat, then the plant, native plants to support your habitat garden, people would kind of have to decrease their lawns in order sure. to actually expand the area that wildlife could utilize. So Yeah. And you know, we really encourage people to use native plants. You think about all the time and money you spent mowing that lawn every week and watering it and caring for it. You know, that's a lot of your time and money. If you can put in these native plants, create habitat areas, once they get established, um, they're well adapted to the soil and the climate. So you, you shouldn't need to water them very much. You shouldn't need to mow them. So the, the maintenance is a lot less for something like that. But even where you've got a lawn where you want to keep some green there, there's some wildlife friendly things you can do. Um, clover is something people try to kill the clover in their yard. Well, the little white flowers are great for bees. They're great for butterflies. Um, it, it's a legume, so clover will take the nitrogen in the air and put it into your soil, and that's good for your soil. So um, don't kill the clover. Just enjoy it and let the wildlife enjoy it too. This has been a great year for clover, actually. Even, yeah. the, even the agricultural clover is doing better this year, so maybe it's enhancing our wildlife a little bit. Hope so. When developing a habitat, can the plantings be directed toward a specific species and still be certified? Sure, you, know? you can if you want to, but you don't have to. So there's no specific regimen of plants that, that the program requires you to plant. Um, some people love squirrels, some people hate squirrels. Mm -hmm. So uh, the kind of wildlife mm -hmm. that you choose to attract is really kind of up to you. And then the kind of things that you plant in order to bring that wildlife is really, it's your call. So and as you long as you've got those five elements. And basically you can still be certified as long as you got you the bet. five elements, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to start a habitat certification program in the fall? Since most of the plants and everything are usually available in the spring around here. But. Yeah, and pretty much any time you're ready to go, you can get started. Uh, you think about the natural world, seeds drop, some of them in the late spring and through the summer and the fall. So Mother Nature's you know, giving us seeds all year long. 
Um, so that's one way to start. There's also some native seed suppliers in Nebraska yeah, and native plants. That's what they need. That's what people need to know that there are seed companies that provide that year. There round. are. We've yes. got them right here in Nebraska. Yes. And follows a great time to get started, get your seed beds ready. The Wachiska Ottoman Society has a yard tour every year on Father's Day that uh, shows folks habitat gardens. Uh, and I've toured many of those and have not seen a certified one, even though they have excellent habitat in a lot of those. Are people in Nebraska actually certifying any of their yards? They are. In fact, we've got over 600 certified habitat areas in Nebraska. Most of them are backyards, so they're you know, private residences. But there's some out in public places. The Lincoln Children's Zoo Community Garden is a certified habitat area. Southwest High School in Lincoln has a certified habitat area. Um, the First Lutheran Church on South 70th is one of the more recent habitat areas. And Doan College, the whole Creek Campus is a certified habitat area. Mm -hmm. And there's a group called Green Bellevue up in Bellevue. Um, they're working to make Bellevue, Bellevue the first certified community habitat in well, Nebraska. That's a great idea. What are the benefits of becoming a certified habitat yard instead of just being a planting a bunch of habitat stuff? Do you think there's a benefit of being becoming certified? For the people? Sure. Well, the first thing is you have that knowledge that you're doing it right. You're doing the right things to bring yes. wildlife to your lawn, so to your yard. So that's, that's important. important. But you also get you get a certificate, so it kind of gives you some appreciation yes. for the work that you've done. Yeah. You, you have the, the opportunity to purchase one of those cool backyard habitat signs that you can you put go. in the your yard. The plaque is showing right now that you can post on your yard. Yeah. So and you have the and you get a free subscription to an e-newsletter from National Wildlife Federation about gardening for wildlife. So we'll give you some tips and tricks and help you share what you're doing with others. Would our, how would our viewers get started certifying, getting their, the process of getting certified? How would they get started and know what to do, you know, sure. to, to really do that? Well, there's a couple ways. Um, you can go, it's a National Wildlife Federation program. So you can go to the NWF website, which is nwf.org click on that Garden for Wildlife emblem there and that will get you a lot of information about gardening for wildlife. It will also um, let you start the certification process online. It's a pretty painless process. You just kind of tell them about what you're doing. On our website, Nebraska Wildlife Federation, so that's nebraskawildlife.org, yeah. we've got information that's Nebraska specific on some of the specific Nebraska wildlife and species that um, you may want to promote and that you may want to plant. And we're, uh, we'll have a link there to the National Wildlife Federation certification site. So we can, that's, that'll, that's great. that'll get that you started. Be, that should be something even I can do. I, for one, think it's very important for urban residents to do the best, do their best to offset their rural habitat losses. And one third of the food that we eat is dependent upon pollinators and habitat to support pollinators is in serious decline right now. So this program can certainly help this situation and can bring some enjoyable species into everybody's lives. So I would like to thank my guest, Dwayne Haworka from the Nebraska Wildlife Federation for telling us about certifying a wildlife habitat. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn or to start a wildlife habitat area. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. Are women's hats coming back in fashion? How long has it been since you've worn a hat? Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and our guest today on Live and Learn is Margie Trembley. She designs hats, and she's from Omaha, Nebraska, and we welcome you to Live and Learn, Margie. Thank you for nice having me. Nice to have you here. I want to tell you about three wonderful stores that we had in Lincoln, Nebraska. Goals, Miller & Payne, Hovland's, all of which had hat departments, not only for women, but for men. They're all gone now. What happened to hats? What happened to hats? Well, in the 60s, people started becoming very casual. It was the hippie time, and 
people didn't need hats. They didn't need to dress up because dressing up was sort of dressing down. Um, and so there was kind of a decline, but what I see, and because of the milliners that I know, there is a resurgence. You open up a Vogue, you open up any of the fashion magazines, and I guarantee you, you're gonna see hats. Mm -hmm. And so I think they're coming back, but of course, they did sort of go away for a while. But I I'm think about President Kennedy and not wearing a hat, because he had all this wonderful hair. And I, did, did men kind of stop wearing hats after he stopped wearing them? It's I wonder possible. if that was a factor. A it's lot of possible. factors went, went, but we met, don't you miss, kind of miss hats? <laughs> okay, when did you start making hats? I started Marcy? about five years ago. Um, I was a felter, and so I worked with wool. You were a felter, what's I, a felter? A felter is someone who works with wool, um, wool roving and soap and water. It's kind of an old fashioned way to make felt the fabric felt. And so it's done with uh, just agitation of the wool and olive oil, soap and water, and you get a kind of a hard fabric. So I took a class to learn how to make hats and doing it that way. And then I started taking millinery classes that were uh, in Chicago and other places. And how long have you been making hats now? About five years. About five years. Yes. Okay, we're gonna take you back to the 1890s to show what women were actually wearing then and a fascinator hat. Look at that, <laughs> I love uh -huh. it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> can you want any comments on that? That's, that's pretty cool, <laughs> that's pretty cool, I like it. And it actually is a hat, it just got all of that beautiful extra stuff that's along it. Okay, now let's look at today's fascinator. Whoa, <laughs> what do you think about that? Do you like hats that big? Well, I do like hats that big. I don't find myself enjoying wearing things that are that big. Uh, but I think that's a really cool hat. That's all feathers from the looks of it, and uh, I think it's pretty cool. Well, that's the fascinator, and it's certainly fascinating. Now, uh, when, when we think of the Kentucky Derby, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and all of the, the major horse racing events, well, there, guess who's there? Mm -hmm. the American Pharaoh, who of course won the, the Triple Crown. That was very thrilling. We think about the resurgence of hats. So you see all those women in hats. Now, look at, okay, now, here's an example. This was at the Kentucky Derby. What do you think about that hat? Well, I think it would be very hard to maneuver around and be close to someone you want to have a conversation with. I saw many hats. I've been to the Kentucky Derby twice, and I saw many hats like that. And it's very difficult to get close to that person to have a conversation or, uh, you know, just to, just a chat, so I think it's a little large. Well, is the idea of the bigger is better, or is everyone trying to outdo everybody else with, with look at my hat? But it is fun to kind of see those. It, <laughs> it is, it really is, is, it is. Yeah, they do try to outdo one another, and, and gaudy colors too. Oh yeah. It's kind of unbelievable. Well, you're thinking about trying to have a conversation with somebody. It's hard. You know, that's got a, a hat this, this big, you'd have to really get in there and say, what did you say? Yes, it's <laughs> Tune hard. Tune up the hearing aids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, now we're going to look at some of Margie's creations. And let's start with the beautiful red hat in the back. And if you'll describe that Okay, for us. I will. This hat is a, it's a summer hat. It's made of cinema. And it has it's made of what? Cinema, which, cinema, what's which that? is a fabric that uh, actually comes uh, originally from the Philippines, it's a plant, and it it gets processed. Uh, it kind of grows like corn, and so this was done over a hat block, and um, then I decorated it. It's just one of my favorites, and I think it's a great Nebraska hat. It feels very very lightweight. It is lightweight. Um, it has been stiffened, um, otherwise it wouldn't hold its shape, and uh, it is lightweight. Uh, sometimes if you put too much weight on a hat, mm -hmm. instead of it laying like it's supposed to, it's gonna tilt, and that's not always a good idea. So you're holding it on the head by what? This particular one, I'm holding uh, by elastic. There's a little elastic cord that you use. There's about three or four different ways you can hold a hat on. Uh, hat combs, a uh, combination of lots of different things. All right, now let's t let's take a look at this one here. What, what, describe this for us. Okay, this is a straw hat. It's also done over a hat block, and this is a silk uh, flower, and there's some very special netting that I've been able to find that this here that I love using. I just think it really uh, 
makes the hat be just kind of outstanding. And then we've got a little jewel piece there. Well, it seems quite a contrast between the very, very large hats and these small hats. Mm -hmm. well, what, what's the difference and why? Well, um, it really depends on what you're going to, what you're, you know, where you're going to be wearing oh, them. Yeah. Um, at the Derby, for instance, a lot of the bigger hats are down um, in the area where people don't pay a lot for their tickets. A lot of the really nice, wonderful hats are smaller. Oh. So, you know, maybe someone who's famous might want to wear this more than they would want to wear that one. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it just really depends on the individual. Now, here is a more, I would call this a more modest hat. What, what, what do we call it? Do you call them anything or it doesn't matter anymore? Um, I don't have specific names for them. I, I have names for them, but I don't, I don't call them a certain thing. This actually, the block came from France and um, it's, this is a wonderful winter hat. Uh, this is made out of fur, uh, out of velour felt, and it has a dichroic glass uh, decoration piece that my husband made. Um, and it's so just he helps you. Well, husbands a are nice bit. to have around sometimes. They <laughs> are. They are. They are. I just needed something, and I said, "Make me something." So he he did that little piece as an accent. Okay. Now we want to take a look at the hat that you're wearing on your head. Okay. If we can ho hold it, so we can take a nice picture of that, so we can see it. Now, what that looks to me. Now I don't know what I'm talking about, but that looks like a fascinator hat to me. Is that, well, would you call that a fascinator hat? I probably would not call this a fascinator. Well, um, it's fascinating. Well, it is, <laughs> it is. A fascinator is a hat that's to be worn on the forehead. So oh. it's a decoration for the forehead, although this is decorating my forehead, but oh, a fascinator oh. is a decoration for the forehead. Um, this, I would call this a small picture hat. This is made out of hemp braid and I wove all the pieces and actually this particular one I did in a class. I took a class from a girl from the Netherlands and she taught us how to do this. And so I, I kind of call it Eugenie's hat because that's her name and she, she taught me how to do this. Well, even, as, even though it's large, it looks very lightweight. It is. So it is very lightweight. How do you attach it or fix it to your head? This particular one has a hat inside the hat. So there's a small, oh. a little small hat underneath this ah. that is shaped like a hat, like just a little beanie. And then uh, this one, I have the elastic and I've also used bobby pins to hold it down. But so it is very lightweight. Yeah, it's not going to fall off. You don't feel uncomfortable or insecure. It's yeah. not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and it's easy to travel with because this one, I just, I just kind of fold it up and it lays flat and it's, it's very easy to travel with. Now, here's another one that probably looks a little familiar to us because this is Nebraska. <laughs> and uh, well, what, what do you call this? This actually is a fur felt hat. And it is, um, and then I did the leather, I dyed the leather and uh, you know, it, you the, could- The leather band? The leather around, band, yeah. yes. And this is actually uh, fur, fur felt uh, is, the, is what it's called. And uh, these hats are a lot more expensive than others because the materials that you make them out of are a lot more expensive. So, uh, and what, what do you hat. call this again? I mean, I, I'd call it a safari hat. Of I would call it a safari oh. hat too. That's a great name. <laughs> That's a great name. Yes. All right. Now let's take a look at this again. A smaller hat. Yes. This Describe I, this one for us. This we could call this a fascinator. Um, it is also a cinema hat, and uh, it was made on a hat block that had this little indentation. So when I, I actually, I steam the cinema over a hat block and lots of other things that I have to do to make it where it's gonna be comfortable for the wearer. But um, nice little accent of feathers and a little, little pin. This could be worn anywhere. This could be dress up or dress down. It doesn't really Does matter. Does it matter the size of your head? In other words, some people have larger heads and smaller heads. So where would you wear it? I call this a very, very small hat. Well, would that look funny on someone with a big head? It really wouldn't. No. It really wouldn't. This, this one would fit anyone. Um, a hat like this, this particular one, or a hat, so a hat like this, a lot of hats like this, you, you actually have to measure the head. And I actually, had, I actually uh, made a hat for someone who had a 26 inch uh, around. Oh, oh. 
a size head, and, yes. a 26 inch head, not a waist? A head, <laughs> and actually 22 and a half is average. So, um, our heads are that big? Some I never are. thought about you that. You also have to think about hair because that does affect things too. Now let's take a look at some of Margie's other creations. They are fascinating. Now this one is, uh, has a white veil on it. Would you describe this one, Margie? Yes, uh, this hat is um, made out of all kinds of interesting things. It actually is made out of cotton batting, if you can believe that. Uh, and then it's put on a base and lined and a lot of frou-frou, some really wonderful uh, pheasant feathers that are unique. And uh, it's, just, it's just a fantastic hat. It's, it stays in my collection. And here's another one. And now, I love the color of this. Uh, this is lavender. Is that what you're yes. looking at? That hat matching her outfit. Describe yes. that one. Okay. This hat actually was worn in Fashion Week. Uh, and that's lovely Jennifer. Jennifer. And that's made out of cinema. Uh, it is formed over a hat block. And it has matching uh, swirly things and uh, peacock feathers that were dyed. And it's just, again, another favorite. Smashing. <laughs> and you even make hats for children. I do. I do. Uh, these are two darling twins from Omaha. And actually, one of the hats, uh, the girl in the dark coat, that actually was bought by a lady. Uh, and she wore it to a wedding in Ireland. But the others are for children. And I have a great time with that. Beautiful work, Margie. Thank you. Omaha has a fashion week. And uh, your, your hats were featured. And we have a picture of the model on the runway in uh, Omaha Fashion Week. Can we take a look at that? There, oh yeah, look at that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at that hat and the outfit. I like to explain that one to us. Well, this, this is uh, the first time that my hats were on in Omaha Fashion Week on the runway. And this is just a very huge, huge hat. Um, and it got a lot of press because it is, it really is, it really does stand out and, and it was the first thing that came out and it was, the, it was on the front page of the newspaper and everything, but it, it's, it, it looked gorgeous on the model. And down the front, which you cannot see, is uh, some metal uh, chain and, it, and oh. so that kind of made it really cool. Oh, that's outstanding. <laughs> I bet yeah. that got a lot of attention. It did. The hat boxes were so convenient for carrying these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, now this is this is for carrying the little one, but are they still making the great big hat boxes? They're very very hard to find. Um, I recently had some made for me, and there's only like a couple places in the U.S. that actually make them. These actually were made in New Hampshire, uh, and it was uh, specially made. This is out of fabric. I've got others that are 24 inches is the biggest I have, and uh, they are they made they have paper but uh, paper lining, but they're, they're kind of hard to come by. Well, if you'd like to see some more of Margie Tremblay's hats, uh, we certainly have a, um, uh, a www address for you to follow if you want to jot this down on the web at uh, Margie, M-A-R-G-I-E, Tremblay, T-R-E-M-B-L-E-Y, chapeau, the French word for hat, C-H-A-P-E-A-U-X.com. Margie Tremblay Chapeau.com. Margie, what a treat, and thank you for coming in. Thank you for Did having you do me. This? And remember, folks, it's never too late to live and learn how to make hats. I'm Tom White, and my guest today is Steve Bors from the Entrepreneurship Center. He's the director of the Entrepreneurship Center at Southeast Community College. Welcome, Steve. Glad you're here today. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity. So can you tell us a little bit about the Entrepreneurship Center? Yes. It was started 10 years ago. We'll have our 10-year anniversary in February. Uh, it was started by Tim Matan. Uh, and the program has grown over the years. We're very proud of it. We provide coaching services to people who want to start small businesses. We have an on-site incubator. So uh, if someone needs office space to launch their business, uh, if they meet our criteria, they, they can uh, have an office uh, in our incubator for up to three years at below market rates. 
And our whole goal is to really try to reduce some of the risk involved in starting a new business. That's great. And so can you tell us how senior adults can benefit from the entrepreneurship? Center? Absolutely. Uh, we deal uh, with a wide variety of people and uh, our incubator right now includes people that are in their 20s uh, and all the way up to, I, I'm not sure what the high end is, but probably 70. Uh, we have uh, three tenants in our incubator right now that are, are seniors and retired from their original jobs and now starting businesses as a second act. So uh, we will help anybody that walks in the door achieve their dream of owning a business. And uh, if we can't help somebody, we usually have other resource providers in town that we can refer people to. And so what or some of just like you have this I'm thinking you have a spectrum of business of all sorts of ideas and what would some of those be we do we we deal with people every day that will walk in and, and share an idea with us and our first step is to really get them to research that idea to make sure that there's going to be a demand for their product or service because that's the number one reason businesses fail is because there is not a demand for the product or service that's being provided mm -hmm. So we really try to get people uh, to consider that very carefully. Uh, and in our incubator right now, we have a wide variety of businesses. We have a, uh, two gentlemen who have a business. They're importing energy drinks from Croatia. Uh, we have um, a business started by a senior uh, called a Bridge to Better Living. Uh, that business is in, uh, has been incredibly successful so far. They will they meet with seniors who are considering a, a change in residence and perhaps moving to a, a retirement community or assisted living. Uh, they'll interview them uh, extensively to find out their needs, their budget, uh, all kinds of things, uh, their health needs. Uh, and then they'll recommend um, a place in Lancaster County that would be the best fit for them. And that's a free service to the senior. Uh, and so that business is very vibrant, and they have recently opened an Omaha office. So we're very proud of them. So, and um, tell us about the Thursday coffee. Yes, we have a, a Thursday coffee at 10 o'clock uh, each Thursday. It's open to the public and whoever wants to attend. So it's a great opportunity to come to the, the Entrepreneurship Center, meet other entrepreneurs, uh, meet resource providers that work with entrepreneurs, people like uh, attorneys, CPAs, um, advertising people. Um, we have a sponsor every week that will speak for 15 to 20 minutes and then we open it up to questions and then we just have general networking. And we have people hanging around sometimes for two hours after the coffee, networking, talking, uh, discussing business, uh, making referrals to one another, so forth. So if anybody has an interest in starting a business, that'd be a great first step. Come to one of our coffees, you can see our facility, uh, and you can meet uh, some of our staff members. I understand you have a couple of events coming up that would appeal to a broad spectrum of people, but there's one in particular that's geared towards seniors. Is yes. That? On November, I'm going to have to put my reading glasses on here, but on November 5th, uh, we're participating in, a, in an event uh, sponsored by the Small Business Administration and ARP, AARP. Uh, it's on Thursday, November 5th from 4.30 to 6.30. Uh, it will be at the Country Inn Suites on North 27th. Uh, and the name of the event is L Speed Mentoring and Resource Fair. So there's going to be a number of resource providers uh, from southeast Nebraska at this event. Uh, they're all dedicated to helping people start businesses, and this particular event is targeted at seniors in particular. So um, uh, e there's even a light meal included, and if people are interested, they can uh, look it up on the web at events.sba.gov. So uh, I would really urge that. Uh, it's a great event. It's free, and there'll be all kinds of great information there for people that uh, want to start a business. And the, then there was another event that had to do with creati creativity and yes. art. Yes. On October 2nd, at the Entrepreneurship Center, at, at 2 uh, o'clock to 3.30, there's a free event called the Business of Art. And it's designed for people who uh, are, have artistic uh, passions, and they want to turn that artistic passion into a revenue flow. 
So we help, we'll help people uh, turn their uh, art passion into a business. And, and we've seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest in that event so far. And so you had mentioned one uh, senior that's in your incubator center, but you had told me there were a, f a couple of others yes. at least um, in the incubator. I'm, I mentioned Bridge to Better Living. That's mm -hmm. owned by Marianne Stallings, mm -hmm. um, and that business has done very well. Uh, we have uh, Mr. James Terry in our incubator. Uh, James has a business uh, called uh, Jazz Time Smooth Radio, and it's an internet radio station featuring smooth jazz, and he also books jazz musicians for special events. And I had the opportunity to go to one of James's uh, events uh, about a month ago, and it was first class, really great, and the musician was terrific. Uh, so he does a real nice job with that business. And then we also have two gentlemen that started an insurance agency in our incubator called uh, ABC Insurance, and they specialize in long-term care policies, Medicare supplements, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so those are three of the businesses that we work with right now that are owned by seniors. Is there any additional information? Because I, I think there are probably a lot of people who have been working in some job their whole life and have always had this idea of something that they were sure and they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. But as you said earlier, does that translate into something that the public wants or needs? Yes. And so for those who... What's the determination of that? How do you... Uh, how can you determine that? How can you words? determine whether Yes, that? we use a technique, it's widely used in the tech industry now, it's called the Lean Launch Pad. And that actually is a methodology that we use in our coaching that steers people through the process. And it really involves going out and talking to people that you think are gonna be your customers. Uh, the worst people to ask for business advice uh, or whether you have a good idea, are friends and relatives. <laughs> the worst. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. Mm. They may even lie to you in, in an attempt to be nice to you. Uh, but if you think you've got a good idea, don't bounce it by your friends and relatives. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. So we recommend that people get out of the building, go talk to people that would be prospective customers, and ask them uh, a series of questions to determine whether your product or service is meeting a need. Oh, that's, I love the place. The, the Entrepreneurship Center itself is, how old is it again? It was 10 years? Yeah, 10 we've been there 10, years, 10 uh, years. And we're located at uh, roughly 68th and O Street, and we're two blocks south. So yeah, I really recommend, Gallup even building. for non people that are, don't have an entrepreneurship idea, just to go see this place. It's, it's uh, and to see the, the, the incubator offices, uh, everybody has been so nice there. There's a great, you have a great staff. Well, thank so, you. Um, so is there anything else that you might want to pass on to us about? No, I would just urge everybody that if they really have a passion or a desire to start a business, uh, come see us. Uh, give us a call, look us up on the internet. We're on, uh, we have a page on Southeast Community College's website. Um, we're on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we have a, usually a monthly special event that we hold or host it, that's free to the public. And so if you want to look into what it takes to start a small business, let us know. We, we've got staff that's trained uh, to help people start businesses so that we're there to help. And we, would, we love doing it. it it's, uh, it's our passion. So. Well, Steve, thank you so much. Uh, my guest today has been Steve Bors, who is the director of the Entrepreneurship Center at Southeast Community College. My name's Tom White, and remember, it's never too late to live and learn. <laughs>